So thank you again for uh, attending the next um, talk. And uh, I have here with us today Jeffrey Brendicke. Brendicke. <laughs> All right. And uh, Jeffrey will be talking on Qt and the pre-user and the unified experience. Thank you, Jeffrey. OK, well, thank you. I'm really glad to be here today and be able to talk about these subjects, especially because somehow the keynotes appeared to have prepared everyone for them. Um, and I was really quite surprised. When I uh, came here, I was thinking we're going to see a lot of uh, more uh, conventional approaches to things. And I uh, saw some people really trying to look into the future. And uh, that's what I really tried to design my presentation about. So I'll go ahead and begin. Uh, let's talk about what is the pre-user. What do I mean by that term? I'll introduce uh, a uh, pilot project I'm working on called uh, Lang234 uh, Language Instruction. I'll talk about the issues uh, related to uh, what I call be caught in the middle. I'll talk about the challenges pre-user is facing in developing for a modern environment, uh, queued for use on tools for the pre-user, and then some notes in the end on the unified user experience. So what is the pre-user? The pre-user is the user of the app before the user is the user. Uh, so we know the term end user, so we have the uh, user, everyone who comes before the user, and that's going to be uh, design, development, testing, internationalization, content writers, and um, anyone who's doing any training. And uh, the traditional way that we see things, or at least the way that things have been handed to us by uh, the industry, is that a lot of providers of platforms tend to think in their own silos. So when I say silo, I'm thinking of like a grain silo or, or a uh, uh, silos used on farms as a, a vertical shaft in which you are basically confined. You can only move within the spaces that they give you. If you try to move outside the spaces, they'll be causing problems for yourself. And uh, to mention a couple of the items that are associated with being in silos, platform-specific uh, APIs. Uh, we have platform-specific uh, programming languages. Uh, we have hu uh, human interface guidelines and so on. A lot of these tend to be very specific for a platform, such as Android or iOS or Windows. So cute QML is the silo slayer. Uh, and what's really great about this is that um, it means that because of the fact you don't really, you yourself, someone who's done all the hard work for you, don't have to deal with all these uh, medley issues with the uh, uh, various platforms. You can get something that will, uh, you can design, you can focus on making the app, and you can get it to uh, be deployed on a number of platforms, a very large number of platforms and a growing number of platforms. So the... Um, the other thing I um, mentioned about uh, Qt is that it's not really just good for creating apps. I'll talk about this in a little more detail. It's also good for creating tools you use to create your apps. And um, an aspect of it being a very platform independent is that it enables the possibility of a, a bring your own device scenario. And that means that your workers for your company are bringing their own uh, tablets, cell phones, and you're putting an application on them. And you do not have to create specific applications then for each platform. And then there's also the freedom of content delivery models. I was really excited to hear about the keynote today from uh, Lars Gnoll about uh, thoughts about how uh, Qt's going to make access to various cloud services easier. Uh, briefly about the Lang23 project, it's uh, one that's in uh, progress. It's a language training framework basically designed uh, around the way I think when I uh, learn a language. And uh, the emphasis is on uh, storytelling approach and repetition. Uh, you, as far as the overall design, nothing unusual, QML, user interface, C++, backend. And these are the platforms I'm looking at uh, deploying it on. And I would call each of these platforms as a challenge. Well, you could say, OK, the iPhone ecosystem is uh, maybe multiple challenges in and of itself, but I'll just group them together here. What is caught in the middle? Caught in the middle is something that, uh, well, the Qt company and everyone contributing to Qt is for you. 
Uh, that you have a common framework, but you have, they have to adapt everything to what's changing underneath them. So changes in hardware, changes in operating systems, uh, APIs get deprecated, APIs are deprecated and then they go away. Uh, and then you also have to deal with uh, nuances in the libraries that depend on from the operating system. Uh, human language support is uh, very dependent on depending what you're running it on. And then uh, offline, online content models. Solutions to being caught in the middle is basically either uh, Qt or most likely both, you and uh, the Q company and all contributors need to stay on top of these things because they're always changing underneath you. And uh, so that means when you're working on one these, in these scenarios, it's, it's very important to try to test your features, at least for feasibility, very early on. Uh, vigilance is necessary. And um, another thing you have to take, keep an eye on is the fact that the platforms underneath you may force upgrades on you. And that's always lovely, especially as you're getting down to a uh, deadline. Uh, so you need to take advantage of early user uh, adoption in order to test these things out. Another item which I'm going to highlight here is human language support. Um, uh, one of the uh, languages I was looking at uh, uh, using as a prototype language for Lang23 is Arabic. Tried to learn a little bit of it. And what I uh, have what I call the, the Kasra test, named for uh, uh, one of the Arabic short vowels which you normally don't write. And there's a huge discrepancy between platforms on how this is developed from very good to crashing into other lines. So that's something you need to take a look uh, very early on before you decide on how you're going to implement the project. And the other thing is then plan for your online offline scenario. That can be a whole lot of work in and of itself. I'll talk about these various platforms uh, and my focus note here, very empty slide. Uh, I'm not, I do not code very happily on, on Java. I can do it if I have to. But the work that, I've done, that I found done uh, for me with uh, Qt means that whatever I write for the other platforms tends to work very well on Android, and I don't have to worry about it. So the funny thing is, um, I remember seeing in the um, documentation about the Android NDK uh, where Google writes in there, uh, do not use C++. Uh, this because you do not want to code in Java. Well, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to <laughs> use that because I do not want to code in Java. And um, it works really great. Extremely happy about it. Uh, Windows Desktop tends to work very well. That's why I found is um, uh, you can use Qt Creator, the, the tool chains, everything works really uh, fine. It's just uh, sometimes with, I've noticed the uh, Visual Studio Debugger is very good, and it has a, what I think is a very nice place in the fact that you can code your uh, platform common language or debug it if you have to, uh, and then all your other platforms will benefit from that. If you can get the debugging experience you need from um, uh, one of the other debuggers, that's, that's great too. Uh, but one thing also to uh, keep an eye on is the uh, uh, make sure that your C++ standard is supported in what you need to do with uh, CL.exe. Now, if I focus with the platforms is QTI and iOS. That's, that's an adventure. Apple is its own special thing. Uh, this was mentioned by Linda Leukas about, uh, and I thought the description was very good. Uh, Qt Creator for iOS works very well for most things, and I'm very glad that I do not have to use that storytelling infrastructure that they have in passing variables through these various segs and so on. And, um, and Qt Creator just keeps getting better. Every release is even better. Uh, yeah, but the thing about it is sometimes the platform underneath me is being changed. Uh, I had a um, uh, nice issue then with... Uh, Without even looking, I suddenly found that I had Xcode 9 on the system. And then that means that I had to fix another bug because they weren't working together. Um, so uh, this said, they work pretty well, but the, um, there's some times where you can't really rely only on Qt Creator. Um, the other thing I found is Qt Creator does not work with Objective-C++ too well. 
Uh, on the other hand, Xcode is really great with Objective-C++. It uh, has very good deployment uh, test cycles, runs and compiles a little bit faster, uh, maybe about 33% uh, um, faster. Uh, instrumentation, everything has uh, worked for Apple's platforms. Um, if you want to uh, integrate with your iWatch, it's a great way to do it. Uh, but um, it's a funky to try to integrate anything. And Qt Creator, when you were developing for iOS, will create a throwaway uh, Xcode project that uh, you can't really modify. So you can adapt to this. Uh, Xcode projects are really a file structure. You can put in uh, what you want in there. I found this is maybe the way to start because the other platforms you can kind of sneak in there where they, they fit. Um, the, uh, you can also, it's also the best way if you have to extend with uh, um, platform native features such as uh, file access scenarios which are very uh, particular on iOS devices or you have to integrate with the health code or Apple Pay or whatever. Also the iWatch uh, integration um, is very good through Xcode and um, so once you have your project set up it, it, it works pretty nicely. Okay, but the one thing I want to mention here, and I'll show uh, here at the top, at the bottom, is build configuration files. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has taken a look at this. I remember looking at these when Xcode was in, uh, what, 8.31 or so, and I found them documented, but the documentation looked really old. And it didn't seem very complete, and then all of a sudden, I found this great Xcode configuration file documentation. But it was all written for Xcode 9. Uh, so it looks like Apple is re uh, revitalizing this thing. Once you know how to work with them, they're fabulous because you don't have to deal with these nasty trees in the GUI for setting up parameters. You can share them. They're just text files. You can access your environmental variables, your Xcode variables, and it works really, really great. They're not as nice as uh, what you get with uh, QMake. QMake is luxury as far as I'm concerned. Um, they're very basic, but they'll save your sanity. So uh, this shows a, a simple project here set up in uh, Xcode. Qt works in there. Uh, the, you can get your lookups, uh, your code completion works, everything for both uh, C++ and for the uh, Apple native platforms. Uh, what we have here over on the uh, left is then the, uh, what I highlighted, some area where the uh, Qt generated files need to appear. Now, how do they get there? This is basically just what uh, QMake does for you. Over on the right, they set up a pre-process that will generate these things and uh, put them into the Xcode project. And this includes Qt uh, quick compiler output, uh, uh, resource compiler output, plugin scanners, and so on. And uh, once that stuff's in there, you see, I don't even need the QML files here anymore. All I need is the, um, what the Qt quick compiler and so on generated for me. Okay, uh, the next uh, topic I'll, I'll highlight is cute uh, for um, pre-user tools. And um, what I found cute is it has a lot of functionality in it. It's like um, Python, maybe not quite as uh, comprehensive when you think of all the Python libraries out there. But if you combine cute on a Linux machine where you just got basically about everything you could ever dream of and run that in a virtual system, you can integrate it into your uh, build processes and save yourself a lot of work and uh, trying to set up things using uh, uh, group over on uh, Apple or try to figure out how to get these things over the windows. You can just run these processes on a virtual machine through SSH or uh, through um, uh, the visual interfaces as you need to. And I also found these uh, pre-user tools are very nice because you can experiment with things. You know, there's nothing you're shipping. You can see what, how you can uh, maybe do th some things with them. Maybe they even become a product in their own right later on. Um, okay, with the areas here, the, uh, especially data processing, I'll mention in conjunction with the uh, Lang23 project, um, what I started off with was basically a very, because I need the markup at the word and punctuation level in uh, text files, a uh, very uh, initial um, simple text format. And then I uh, started with that and I processed it through an Objective-C++ Qt app that I created that used the NS Linguistic Tagger, it's a really fabulous tagger, 
and uh, that was built in uh, to Macintosh, probably could run it off an iOS device if you're creative. And then I created what I call a uh, Xeta text structure. Xeta is a um, um, information markup aggregation uh, language. I threw a draft of it up on the internet last night. Uh, and it basically, it started off as uh, XML made to look like Python. It ends up looking like very naked uh, YAML. And, um, uh, and it also made it very easy with uh, very simple text files to modify uh, the uh, uh, hierarchical data. And then I used that then to create other things such as um, uh, an XML file, which I then processed with uh, XSLT to generate other outputs. Uh, what I wanted to mention about that is one of my goals is trying to test uh, and put the, the um, patternist technology on top of this in order to, from Qt, then be able to use my non-XML structure and being able to process it with X XSLT or XQuery. But I haven't gotten that far yet. Okay, now going on to the unified user experience. We've heard a lot about this. This is really the same, having the same user interface for everyone, uh, regardless of what platform they're on. Um, and I have an example here from Adobe Illustrator, and I was uh, quite surprised when I first saw this because I run it on both Windows and Macintosh, and one of these is from Windows and one is from the Mac. Can anyone tell me which is which? They're really, really similar. The only thing I can see the difference between them is where the close and create buttons are. They're swapped on one platform, but everything else, as far as I can see, is the same. And uh, Adobe has done a very good job of creating one interface that seems to work on both of my junk between the two platforms. I don't have to think so much on what platform I am except for the you know, control command key uh, dance, but uh, other than that, the um, platforms are very similar, and we've seen this a lot, and we heard this on uh, several of the keynote uh, speeches that we have, that this is really the way things are going. What was interesting was hearing a talk today um, by Eckes, where he was talking about a, a platform that uh, uh, Nappy had created for use in the um, uh, medical industry, and it was the same interface, Android and iOS, and uh, there was a backwards navigating button up on the top. And he says his users really don't care. And that's very interesting. I don't think users really care, as long as they can figure the thing out. If you think about a lot of these science fiction films, you see where uh, someone comes in from uh, elsewhere to come on a forward planet, and they have this big one, these fancy futuristic uh, control panels in front of them, and they get in there, and I don't know how they know these ancient languages or whatever, and they're fiddling and dialing things, although maybe this thing was built a thousand years before or something like that. Um, the thing is that once your users really know what to do, what are my options? I can scroll up, I can get scroll down, left, right, uh, and they'll try things out, and if you do a good job on your UI, they're not really going to care. It says, oh, that's not really quite what belongs on an Android device. So... Um, uh, I think the unified user experience is here, and it's going to stay. So instead of thinking about your platform, what platform you're developing on, think about, I have an app, now how do I make it work on the various screens I have available to me? Um, and the, when you th think of going from a smartphone over to a desktop, what is it that I can, I can really do? And what do the two even have to do with each other? Well, you see what I'm doing here. I'm swiping back and forth. I have a touch screen. So the, the um, interaction between the two vices is very blurred anymore. And um, so what we're seeing is if you want your app to work on a desktop and a smartphone, why not keep the same user interface? And depending on how big you make the window, it can act like the one or the other. So then suddenly, even though you might not think so, a back button over on the top of your screen suddenly makes sense when you're using it off of a... Um, uh, laptop with a touch screen. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I think, okay, what does this watch here have to do with it? Well, what if I want my app and I just want to monitor it? I just want to control something. I don't have a, 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 an Apple Watch. Uh, I can sh shrink then my app down and down and down, and then sooner or later it becomes like a, a smartphone interface, so it gets alongside another screen. And then I make it really small, miniature, and it floats on top, and it looks like the watch with just the bare number of controls I need. 
Um, so uh, other than that, I think this is where things are going. Um, of course, the app stores have the final say on what gets in there, so you'll have to find out, okay, what can I get away with? But from my experience, I've seen some really bad interfaces, and they somehow make it in the app stores. Um, okay, the, uh, then Qt also offers some platform-specific styling where you can tweak some things if you have to, and then there's uh, third-party tools or frameworks that you can use if you need to. So that's the end of my conversation. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jeffrey. So any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you.